Children's Church is dismissed. I'm going to be reading from uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 16 through 19, and I'll give you a moment to find it if you want to follow along. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Church, we are... Week nine of a sermon series on the wisdom literature, and as God's people, we believe um, that God has ordained, created, designed a way for us to walk in this world in his way, and we call that wisdom. When we walk in God's world, God's way, that is, is wisdom. Okay, um, we have been through various different topics. Uh, We've talked about the wise word or, or the use of the tongue how we, we go about speaking, how God's people are called to speak. Um, we have talked about the wise wallet, the wise worker, uh, the wise watch, how we spend our time. And today, I want to talk about the wise wedding, okay, the wise wedding, um, or in other words, the wise marriage. Like, what has God said about marriage, and how do we, in this world, walk in his way uh, in, to create a wise wise wedding. Okay. In 2019, The Atlantic, they released a number of articles um, pertaining to research that they had found on marriage. Okay. And I, I want to um, show you the cover photo from that project. We're going to have Derek throw it up here. Uh, what's being communicated here? And what, what is this image saying? And marriage is such a heavy, heavy load, right? The, the covenant, the rings are, are crushing the couple. I mean, for goodness sakes, she's, our, she's still in her wedding dress and has lost her tan. And, and he's, he's in his tuxedo and has already lost his hair, right? Marriage is a heavy, heavy load. The stress and weight of marriage. In church, the truth is marriage can be weighty at times, can't it? But it doesn't have to be crushing because the Lord has provided us wisdom in order to walk, to live in his world, his way. Okay, so what James read for us earlier, Proverbs 2, uh, I'm going to specifically today look at verses 16 and 17 from that. Um, And it says this, once again, So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. And so we, we come to this topic of marriage And quite honestly, there is a lot uh, that we could dive into, a lot of different ways that we could handle uh, looking into what is wisdom in marriage. But I want to pull from these two verses two foundational truths for us, okay? Marriage was created by God. That's one. And two, marriage is companions living for God. Okay, th- those two things, marriage was created by God, and marriage is companions living for God. So before I, we jump into those two points, we need to understand two things up front, okay, before we get into those, those two things. Uh, first, Proverbs, uh, the Proverbs found in this book about marriage come packaged to us in the form of a metaphor, and that's what those verses were, were there in the form of a metaphor. And early on, if you remember in this sermon series, I pointed out that the question that Proverbs is desiring for us to answer is whether or not you and I will marry Lady Wisdom or whether we will marry Lady Folly. And so even more than that, this book, Proverbs, is, is calling us to wed ourselves 
to, to wisdom that is embodied in Jesus Christ, to practice fidelity to Jesus the way that a faithful husband would to a wife. It's one of the reasons why, why the church, you and me, are called the bride of Christ. Okay, so in, in these verses, there is a warning against adultery, but it's bigger than just adultery. And yet, church, hear me, what is true in the metaphor is true in marriage. Okay, what is true in the metaphor is true in marriage. And so we need to dig into the metaphor to uncover what is true about marriage. Because that's number one, the, the first thing that we need to understand. Second, the verses on marriage in Proverbs are almost entirely, and this is where I struggled writing this sermon, that the, these verses on marriage from Proverbs are almost entirely describing or addressing the wife. Almost every one. The, the husband is almost completely absent. The word husband, I believe, comes up four times in this book, and even in that relation, it's, it's actually connected to the wife. Okay, and so why is that? Why is, is it packaged in that way? Well, this, this book was written from who to who. It's written from a father to a son. And so this, this father is instructing this son on the type of character that he should be looking for in a future wife. But church, we cannot miss the fact that the whole book is a father pleading to a son to be wise. And because of that, if this son is wise, then he will also be a wise husband. And so when we get verses about a wife, you can almost always take that verse and find a similar verse speaking to the man. Okay, so what's true for the wife is also true for the husband. And so that's our two things that we need to understand. This comes in a metaphor, and what's true for the husband is true for the wife. Now, our first foundational truth, marriage was created by God. And marriage was created by God. As Christians, we affirm what the scriptures say and teach from its very first pages, right? In Genesis, what we see is God created marriage. It was his doing. It was his idea, and so you will never, ever have a wise wedding or a wise marriage if you don't start there. That, that is the very foundation of a wise marriage, right? Genesis, it, God shows up, he makes man, and, and then it's not good that he's alone, and so he creates woman out of the side of man. And then in my mind's eye, God plays matchmaker between the two. Right? God, God officiates and institutes this, this wonderful institution of marriage. And so you can go read about that in Genesis 1 and 2. But we see this very truth in what James read for us in Proverbs chapter 2, 16 and 17. Once more, 16 and 17, so you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, listen now, who forsakes the companion of her youth, that's another way to say spouse, and forgets the covenant of her God. Okay, so once again, this is a metaphor, but what this metaphor is communicating to us is an observation that forsaking the companion of your youth, forsaking your spouse, is equated to forgetting the covenant of our God. And so here's the point. These two relationships, the relationship between the husband and the wife and the relationship between the spouse and God is tied together. Why? Because God has tied the husband and the wife together. Right? He has unified them. At a wedding where, where covenantal vows are made between a man and a woman, the two become one. And th there's a supernatural union that takes place. And hear me, it is a miracle that only God can perform. And so if you're married in here, when, when you said, I do, God did something in your marriage. He did the exact same thing in your marriage that he did for Adam and Eve in taking two and making them one. And so God created marriage, our, our first truth in the very starting place for the wise wedding is that marriage was created by God. And that means, church, on a very practical level, uh, it has ginormous implications for us. 
Okay, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. We'll be back in Proverbs 2 when you're here in a second. But Proverbs 18, 22. Solomon writes there. He who finds a wife or a husband finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Okay, he who finds a wife or a husband, right? It's, it's once again our second thing we need to understand what's true about the wife is true about the husband. So he who finds a wife or a husband finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Church, there is almost an identical verse found in Proverbs 8.35. Listen to it. Proverbs 8.35, for whoever finds me, wisdom speaking, finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Here, once again, Proverbs 18.22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Right? So finding a spouse is a good thing. Getting married is a good thing. You experience the favor from the Lord in marriage. But 8.35, once again, whoever finds wisdom finds what? Life. And obtains favor from the Lord. Do you hear the difference there? In these two parallel verses, the difference between these two. Marriage is good, but it is not God. Marriage is good, but it is not God. The reason why God created marriage is to give us favor. But marriage is not God. It's not a replacement. Right? In both cases, finding wisdom and finding a spouse, we obtain favor from God. That's clear. But hear me, how easy is it to swap the words in those verses? Right? How, how easy is it to, to swap these two verses? If we remove God as the creator of marriage, then we will make Proverbs 18.22 say this, He who finds a wife finds life. Or he who finds a husband finds life. He who finds a spouse finds life. In other words, church, I'm not really living until I'm married. Or I'm not really living until I have the marriage that I've always dreamed of. And if we believe that, then we place a weight and a burden upon marriage that marriage was never intended to hold up. Right? And so, very practical, if you're singing, single, marriage is good, but it is not God. Right? The, the beauty of the gospel is that marriage, it, it, the marriage that matters most is the marriage where Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. And every Christian gets to be every bit a part of that, whether you're married or not. And so for, for those of us who are married, hear me, if we're not careful, we will look to our current homes to heal the wounds from our childhood homes. And we all bring wounds, baggage, into our marriage, right? We, we desire the husband to be the man that dad never was or, or the wife to be the woman that uh, create the home that the, the mom never did, right? We, we expect a God-sized healing to come from a human-sized spouse. And so, yes, hear me, we need to walk through our pains together. But this is very clear. If God is the creator of marriage, and marriage is not God, then our spouse is just the helper and is not the healer. You see, he who finds a spouse finds a good thing, not God. See, he who finds a spouse finds a good thing. Church, the relationship that we most need in life, all of us, is not a spouse, but a savior. That's what we need, right? The embodiment of wisdom found in Jesus Christ. Marriage was created by God. We start there, and then second, marriage is companions living for God. Okay, so flip back to Proverbs 2. One more time. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion. Okay, note that word, underline it if you write in your Bible. Who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. 
Okay, companion. There are a few words in uh, the original language that the Bible was written in, in Hebrew, for that word companion. It, it means friend. It's quite literally closest friend. And so don't miss this. This companionship is used in what context? The context of marriage. And so it's God's design for marriage for a husband and a wife to be companions living for God. On a very practical level, the promise, the covenants made between a husband and a wife at their wedding is a promise to be companions. And so let me define what a companion is before we get into trouble here. Right? Being a companion doesn't mean that you have to be interested in the same things. It doesn't mean that you have all the same hobbies. It doesn't mean that you're homeboys. Right? That's not what a companion means. To be a companion is way deeper than all of that. To be a companion means that you're a friend and not a foe. In church, what's the difference between those two? One's for the per- other person. One's against the other person. So if we take what Proverbs teaches us about a companion or a friend and we apply it to marriage, what we'll see is um, a few things. Let me point out a few here. Proverbs 18, 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a companion, this is the same word, a type of friend who sticks closer than a brother. Okay, Proverbs 17, 17, a friend or a companion loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Okay, so what Solomon is saying here is that there's a type of companion who sticks with their companion through adversity, through difficulty, through, through hard times, loving at all moments. Okay, so think about the vows at a wedding. What, what are they? To have and to hold from this day forth, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish when till death do us part. You see, your spouse that you married is going to change. I heard a fruit, mm hmm. <laughs> right? 5, 10, 15, 25, 30, 60 years later you will have not been married to the same person that you married on that day. And hear me, this is really important. You better not be. Right? God's transforming us. He's changing us, and the way that he does it is he takes hard times and he refines us to be different, to look more like him. And it's going to take a companion in those times to, to preach to us certain things, and we'll get there in a second. Right, on a very practical level, what this is calling us to, the wise wedding, is means don't forsake your companion. Right, don't forsake your companion. Right, think about this. It, it's the very thing that folly does according to Proverbs chapter 2 and six, 16 and 17. Right? Lady Folly does what? Forsakes her companion. Forsakes, it's the very word that we find uh, show up early on in God's words on marriage. Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave, or, or quite literally the same word, forsake his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. And so one way to read Proverbs chapter 2 is that foolishness leaves the one that they were supposed to leave everyone else for. Right? They, they left the one that they were to hold fast to, that God united them with, when they were supposed to leave everyone else for that person. And so the essence of the marital vows are that I am promising to not forsake this companion. And so tune in here, church. This is really really, really important. I'm not saying, I'm not simply saying don't divorce your spouse. I'm saying much more than that. I'm saying don't forsake your companion. And that's different. Right? There is a way to stay married and forsake your companion. L- listen, love does not wear off like the shine of a new toy. It withers like a garden that someone stopped tending to. 
right? It doesn't fade because of time. It withers because it's been forsaken. It's been left. It's been uh, not well taken care of. This is where this gets really, really applicable for us that are married. Marriage is not neutral, right? Every marriage sits in a river, every one. And every marriage is either paddling towards one another or drifting away from one another. And the drift, right, married people, is not a one-time event but a long, slow fade, Right, the this, this spectrum that, that that drift happens on, the, the, the occasion that that happens on, is we start as compa- companions, and then life happens. And through life, we begin coexisting. And then through coexisting, we start to compare ourselves to each other. And then in our comparison, we begin to critique one another. And that's the drift, that's the fade Right, so, so when we drift from companions to coexisting, our conversations come, become way more about our calendar and, and less about how are you. Right, and then, then we move to, to comparing where, where I did this, you didn't do this. Or you did this and I didn't do this. Right, and, and then we move to critiquing. I mean, if you don't paddle towards one another, then you become a critic, an accuser of your companion. And, and you see all of their strengths, or all of their weaknesses and none of their strengths. You go from being friend to foe. Goodness, hear me. Part of being married is seeing the very unfiltered version of each other. Right? You cannot fake who you are in marriage. And so all of your flaws are on full display. Right? I, th- these are the nicest clothes I have. Right? This is the, the filtered version of me. Right? I shaved this morning. I, I spent all week manuscripting what I'm going to tell you today. But my wife, oh, she's seen the unfiltered version of me. Maybe even this morning. Right? She, she's seen me stressed. And she, she see me angry, and she see me sad, and she see me throwing up on the toilet. And besides God, no one has seen the worst of me like she has. And hear me, every single marriage has that type of view on one another. And if you've been married for any length of time, then you've seen the worst of that person. And that gives you power in the life of your spouse. And with that sight, with that knowledge, you will do one of two things. You will either be a companion to your spouse or you will be a critic to them. And if you're a critic, you will start to believe the worst things about them and you will build a case in your head against them. And hear me, there is conflict in every marriage But when conflict comes between critics, then it makes it feel like love's always on the line. Like you always got to win their love. You've always got to earn their love. And you're always defending yourself against the other person. And that is flowing from a deep-seated fear. And the fear is this. If the person that has seen me unfiltered is my biggest critic, then who could possibly love me? Who could love me knowing the worst about me? And if that's the case, then I must be unlovable. And God created marriage to combat that very thing. See, marriage is an evidence of the gospel that there is a God who has seen the worst of us and yet still loves us. And as a companion, we want to help each other believe that love love is real, that love... I looked at my wife. I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> that love's true. That love's unwavering. A love that says, I see you. And there's a God that loves you. And I do too. Matthew 11, Jesus call, is called the companion, the friend of tax collectors and sinners. John 15, Jesus is 
says, greater love has no one seen than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends, for his companions. In church, that's what Jesus did on the cross, right? And that's what he did on the cross. He laid down his life for you and me, for his friends, for his, his bride, his church. So just a few things to consider in closing here. God created marriage. Marriage is good, but it is not God. And so we cannot expect it to give life to us because only Jesus can do that. And second, if you're married in here, where's your marriage at? Where's it at on this river? Where are you finding yourself? The calls to paddle, right? The calls to paddle. And I need to be really specific in one area. If you're forsaking your spouse through adultery or abandonment or abuse, the living God through Proverbs calls you a fool. And God's brought you here today to repent. And here's the promise from God's word that if you repent of that foolishness, even in your foolishness, you will find Jesus to be a companion for you. And if you're in in an unsafe place in here, God desires safety for you. And so would you reach out and get help? Okay, second, this this whole message might have been painful for for some people. Right, because you've acted foolishly, or your spouse has acted foolishly, and you've brought an end to a marriage, or maybe you've had a marriage implode, and you did everything you could to, but you couldn't avoid its ending. Or you're in a marriage right now, and you're feeling like it's unraveling. What's the next step for us? Where that's the reality of the river. Here it is. God loves you. Move towards Him. We we all come at this from different sides, different places, different histories. But Jesus is the solution for where you are right now. And so move towards God. That is what it means to fear the Lord in the beginning of wisdom. And then for all of us married, this is a great ongoing conversation to have. A great question. Where are we at in the river? Where are we at? Maybe... You need help with that conversation. We would love to be a part of that. This has been the number one struggle that has been brought to me over the last nine years as a pastor here. And what I've watched over nine years is Jesus redeem and reconcile and move in the most powerful ways. And so if you need help paddling, let us paddle with you. And so that question, where are you at? Maybe you are critics and you need help. Maybe you're just comparing yourself to one another. Maybe you're just coexisting. But wherever you're at, the call, the wise call, is to paddle towards one another, to pursue one another, to tend one another, to hold fast to your vows. Hear me, church, there is no perfect marriage. And all the married people said, Let's do that again. And all the married, all the married people said, Amen. but there is a perfect God who sits over your marriage and wants to shine the beauty of marriage upon it. See, a lot has changed since your vows, but your promise hasn't and neither has your God. And that's true. May God be praised. Church, he who finds a good thing, finds a spouse, finds a good thing, right? But he who finds Jesus finds life. And we're going to respond thanking the Lord for that, praising God for that reality as we sing in the doxology, number 39, somewhat of a reprise for us from our uh, praise time earlier. Uh, We're going to sing it two times through, With the last time, a cappella, then I will come up and close us in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your great, enduring, unwavering, steadfast love for us. That while we were yet sinners, 
You've seen all of us. You came out of great love to die for us so that we might be forgiven of our sins, resurrected from the dead, and we praise you for that. God, I, I specifically want to pray for the marriages in this room. God, I pray strength upon them. I pray healing upon those that need healing. I pray for courage upon those that need help and wisdom for your people to love one another in that. God, and to walk in wisdom, to walk in your way, in your world, so that we might evidence the greatness of the gospel. So Holy Spirit, Spirit, empower us to that end. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all, all God's people said, amen. Church, you are dismissed. I love you more than you know.